Thanks a lot for the introduction and many thanks for inviting me here to this fantastic place, this fantastic um, uh, colloquium. <clears throat> so I would like to talk to you about the Honeybee Gut Microbiota and I want to show you um, how versatile the system is to actually understand fundamental as well as I think maybe at one point applied aspects of microbial symbiosis, in particular the symbiosis which we have in the gut ecosystems. So in the last few years and decades, we have made a tremendous progress in actually understanding how the gut microbiota of animals affects health and disease, in particular of humans and other mammals. Um, however, I still think there are many challenges we are facing by studying this system. And uh, the major challenge is probably the extremely high diversity we have in these communities, hundreds of species which coexist together. Furthermore, we have a high variability between individuals, so each of us can be colonized by a very different community, so it's very hard to actually um, you know, translate findings from one individual to the other because the communities can be so vastly different. Many of these bacteria or microbes are still unculturable or at least hard to grow under laboratory uh, conditions. And you need to generate micro microbiota-free animals to actually study the impact of the microbiota. <clears throat> And finally, phenotypes are not as obvious, so these are not obligate symbionts, they're not uh, necessarily deadly pathogens, they're facultative symbionts, and often they're very redundant in their function, okay? So it's not very obvious um, um, that they're actually quite important for our well-being. So given this, I think there are still many key questions, important questions, where we have very little answers nowadays, which is, for example, which bacterium actually contributes which function in the gut, how do these bacteria interact among each other? Are they cooperating? Are they competing with each other? Um, which genes are involved in symbiosis in the gut? And finally, how have these communities actually evolved? So I believe that um, simple model systems can, can help to understand what is going on in, in these complex communities, for example, in the mammalian gut. And I think there are two different uh, strategies or two different routes you can take. The first one, which most people probably take, is reduce the complexity. So you work on the, on the popular model system, which for many people is the mouse system. You reduce the complexity. Instead of colonizing a mouse with hundreds of different species, you only colonize it with a couple of species. The other approach is to actually look at an animal which has evolved to harbor a microbiota, a native microbiota of low complexity. And this is actually why we uh, study the honeybees. Um, I want to highlight here that the honeybee, in my opinion, is not only a great model, but it's also an important animal um, because it's a key pollinator for agriculture as well as natural ecosystems. And in the last few years and decades, we have experienced the massive colon declines worldwide, and we're only starting to appreciate that actually the gut microbiota must have an important impact on the health of this uh, pollinator species. So why is this such a great model? So well, the community is fairly simple. It's uh, dominated by seven to eight uh, big, different bacterial members. And I've highlighted here the seven uh, most abundant members in this schematic phylogenetic tree. So we have two gamma protobacterium, which we call Guillemella and Frischella. We have a beta protobacterium, which we call Snodgrassella. Uh, we have one alpha protobacterium, which belongs to the genus Spartanella. Uh, bifidobacterium and two firmicute species groups which actually belong to the lactobacilli. So you see we have here quite exotic uh, species names which many microbiologists of you might not have heard of yet. Um, this is because these bacteria are highly specific to eusocial bees, okay? So they have not been found in the environment. If you build phylogenetic trees, you will find that they sit on deeply branching lineages, so they're quite extinct, uh, distinct from other bacteria which have been studied so far. And also if you look in the gut of honeybees, so you have the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut, these bacteria are localized to very specific compartments, in particular the hindgut region, the ilium, and the rectum. And this is a fish mic microscopy image showing here the host epithelium and the uh, uh, thick bacterial biofilm-like layer composed of several of these species together. So this really suggests that these bacteria have an intimate interaction with the host, but also among each other. Furthermore, this community is really stable, okay? If you sample an adult honeybee in the US, in France, and Switzerland, you will find the main bacterial members in their gut, okay? So it's not as variable as it is, for example, in the mammalian gut. And it's also evolutionally conserved, 
A corset of these bacteria have also been found in bumblebees as well as in stingless bees. So we think actually that this community has, at least the core of this community, has evolved in the last common answer of this uh, carbiculated bees. So what is the impact of this gut microbiota and bee health? Uh, actually, we know or we knew very little um, until um, this year, actually, two recent papers came out from the laboratory of Nancy Moran, where I also did a couple of years back my postdoc. So this is really, uh, uh, really uh, excellent work. So in that first paper, it actually showed that the imbalance gut microbiota leads to increased bee mortal mortality in the hive. Okay? This was really the first experimental evidence that the microbiota has an impact on bee health under natural conditions. The other paper, which actually came out last week, again, the same group, um, showed that the gut microbiota promotes weight gain and insulin signaling. So these are bees kept in the laboratory. We can uh, render them germ-free, and we can colonize them with, uh, with uh, the microbiota. And what you see is that actually these colonized bees <clears throat> uh, gain weight actually much faster than these germ-free bees. So we have also contributed to, uh, to understanding that the gut microbiota um, effects or triggers immune system of the bee in the gut as well as in the hemolymph. And my favorite bacterium um, so far of this community has been Frischella perara, which is a gamma protobacterium. And this guy actually localizes to a very specific region in the gut, which is called the pylorus. It colonizes really only there, the host epithelium, and causes this kind of brown to black band, which is a malnization response of the host. So these are, this is a bee with Frischella, and this is a bee without Frischella. This is just a magnification, another electron micrograph, which shows here the gut bacteria, the melanized region, the, the melanin, which is deposited on the host epithelium between the gut lumen and uh, the epithelial cell layer. And we are very much interested to understand why this bacterium actually triggers this malnization response. What is the underlying genetic and, and specific host response which leads to that reaction in this particular region of the gut? And how does this actually affect uh, the gut microbiota and, and the health status of the bee? So this is one project we are running in the laboratory, but today I would actually like to talk about uh, another project which we have started uh, one or one and a half years ago, um, which is about understanding the metabolic activity of these bacteria, because I think that the bacterial metabolism is the foundation for microbes and symbionts to carry out actually beneficial um, uh, functions for their host. So what we, do we know about the metabolism of honeybee gut bacteria? So well, this is a review which uh, Nancy Moran has published last year. It's data inferred um, from genomic data, okay? So there's no experimental um, evidence yet shown on this slide. But the main idea is that these bacteria actually degrade complex polysaccharides, uh, which is derived from the pollen diet of bees. They ferment these polysaccharides into short-chain fatty acids, which can then be utilized by other gut bacteria. So there seems to be, might be some cross-feeding to other bacteria, as well as they're taken up by the host, okay? So do we have experimental evidence for this? Yes, but only uh, very little. So we know, for example, from a work I've done in Nancy's lab that um, one of these bacterial members is actually able to degrade pectin, which is, which is part of the primary plant cell wall. And in that paper, which was published last week, they actually indeed could show that short-chain fatty acids and other fermentation products actually accumulate massively in the bee gut to a similar extent as in the mammalian gut. So very similar uh, system, actually, as, as the mammalian gut. However, <clears throat> there's still many open questions we which we would like to address. For example, which pollen compounds other than pectin are utilized by this very specific gut microbiota? which metabolites or which bacterial metabolites are accumulating in the gut, and finally also who is responsible for which metabolic activity. And I think here lies really the, the power of this system because we have such a simple community that we can try to disentangle the function of different community members. This is something people who work on the mammalian gut microbiota still, um, ha have, uh, uh, still face a lot of challenges. And then one of the specific questions we also have, if the metabolic output of such a gut community can actually be explained um, by the contribution of individual members in isolation from the other members. So to what extent do we have metabolic in independencies in that system, and to what extent are these gut bacteria which have co-evolved together still metabolic independent from each other? 
So how did we approach this? So we generated these uh, germ-free or microbiota-free bees, as I like to call them. Um, we colonized them with a community which we reconstituted from cultured bacterial strains, okay, representing seven of these uh, major bacterial species found in the bee gut microbiota. And then we also did monocolonizations. And we also um, tried to, re or we, we recapitulated some of these findings using in vitro cultures. I will come to this at the very end of my talk. So after 10 days of colonizations, we dissected the, the hindgut, midgut and hindgut region of these bees, homogenized them, did water extracts, and applied untargeted metabolomics, QTOF, okay? So <clears throat> that we can um, actually determine the metabolic changes between, first of all, microbiota-free bees and bees colonized with that reconstituted community. And then in a second step, actually use these monocolonizations to disentangle which of these community members is actually carrying out which function in this very specific microbial community. So let's start with, uh, with the comparing the microbiota-free bees to the colonized bees. So this is a principal component analysis of the metabolic profiles from these different bees. And one thing we see here very strikingly is that the, the colonized bees cluster independently from the microbiota-free bees, which means they have a very distinct and characteristic uh, metabolic profile in the gut. And what is really nice is that when we uh, included in our analysis hive bees of the same age, which were naturally colonized with the native microbiota, not in the laboratory, we see that actually our colonized bees cluster more closely to these hive bees than the microbiota-free bees. So this was really nice to see. So we next wanted to know what kind of metabolite changes actually do we observe. So in total, we identified 372 metabolites across two independent experiments. And the first thing we did is we divided them into those metabolites which disappear in the presence of the microbiota, which then suggests that these metabolites correspond to bacterial substrates of the microbiota. And on the other hand, we, um, we looked at these metabolites which actually accumulate in the presence of the microbiota. So these are supposedly products which are generated in the gut in the presence of the microbiota. So we still have a large number of metabolites. So we did uh, several analysis to actually identify what kind of compound classes are enriched in these data sets. So we did enrichment analysis. And we also did something which is called the OPLS-DA analysis. So it looks, it's actually quite complicated to calculate this, but it's um, quite intuitive because what you ask here is which metabolites explain most of the differences between my colonized bees and the microbiota free bees, okay? And the metabolites which are most discriminatory for these two conditions are pulled to the two corners of this plot, okay? So those metabolites which are sitting here at, at, the, at the very uh, much at the corner here are those metabolites which are almost completely depleted in colonized bees compared to the microbiota-free bees, and these are the metabolites which accumulate a lot in the colonized bees versus the microbiota-free bees. So I don't want to give you a list of all these most discriminatory metabolites. I rather would like to um, summarize here a few findings. So one thing we found is that nucleosides are um, massively depleted when the microbiota is there, and this is in complete agreement with the genomic data because what we see is that some of these gut bacteria that can't synthesize nucleotides by themselves, so they need to take them up from the environment as nucleosides derivatives. Flavonides were highly depleted when the microbiota was there. Omega hydroxyacids and phenolamides, I will come back to this in a minute, um, because probably this will not tell anything to, to, to you guys at this point. So on the side of the bacterial products, we indeed found fermentation products to accumulate, which is in perfect agreement with what uh, Nancy Moran had, has found in her recent paper. We also found uh, flavonate breakdown products, which is a nice agreement with flavonates disappearing on the side of the bacterial substrate. And what we found very interesting is that we found a couple of host metabolites which are induced in the presence of the microbiota. On one hand, these are icosinates, the prostaglandins, which are supposed to be signaling molecules and insects um, in the immune system. But actually, there's very little known what these guys are actually doing. We also found juvenile hormones, which are important um, hormones for insects, in particular bees, for their behavioral maturation. Um, how this actually links to, to bee behavior, we, we don't know yet, but this is something we would like to follow up in the future. 
So <clears throat> coming back to the bacterial subsets, what was in, really interesting is to find these flavonates, these omega hydroxy acids and phenolamides, because um, when we looked a little bit in the literature, these are actually all components which are, are, which are actually present in the outer pollen wall um, of pollen grains. So uh, a pollen grain is, has a cytoplasm like any other uh, plant cell wall, an inner pollen wall, which actually is the primary plant cell wall, and then it has a very rigid outer pollen wall structure composed of many different secondary plant metabolites, among each other these guys here. So we think that actually the gut microbiome and the hindgut utilizes um, some of these very uh, recalcitrant substrates in the hindgut, which apparently cannot be digested by the host itself. The flavonates were uh, particularly intriguing to us because we identified 36 different flavonates in our data set, and 20 of those were almost completely depleted when the bees were colonized with the microbiota. So there are glycosylated flavonates and non-glycosylated flavonates. Okay, so this is the flavonate backbone and this is the glycosylation. And we know also from the human gut that many bacteria actually deglycosylate these flavonates. However, what would happen then is that you have an accumulation of these flavonate aglycones in the gut of the colonized bees. This is not what we observed. Actually, these non-glycosylated flavonates also seem to disappear. But what we observed is that actually breakdown product of this ring structure accumulated massively in our colonized bees. So what we think what is going on here is that these, this gut microbiota breakdowns many of these flavonates into these breakdown products. So we wanted to know who is doing what, and I think this is the, the, the beauty of, of this system, that it's such a simple community. So we did this monocolonizations, and we actually asked which of these 372 metabolites um, can be explained by these individual bacterial strains or species in our system. So we carried out ANOVA, a statistical analysis, uh, to identify these explained metabolites. And this explained metabolite, I mean those ions which change in the monocolonization, monocolonized bees in the same direction as in the colonized bees relative to the microbiota free bees. And what was really striking is that we could more or less explain 80% of all the substrate and products which we had identified between our microbiota-free bees and the colonized bees by these monocolonizations. So there seems to be very little metabolic in, uh, dependency uh, in the system, even though the, these bacteria have co-evolved for, for many, many time. Um, for example, the firmicutes here, just abbreviated as uh, F5 and F4, they were responsible for most of the metabolic changes we had identified in our colonized bees. Um, what was very striking is that, for example, nucleosides uh, were utilized by almost all the bacteria except for this Snodgrassella um, and alpha-1 and maybe also bifidobacterium. And again, these are exactly these bacteria which can actually synthesize nucleotides by themselves, so they don't need to take them off from the environment while the others have to do that. Flavonates were mainly degraded by the FIRM5 group, so we can now say which bacterium actually is responsible for degrading and this class of compounds. And oikazonates and also the juvenile hormone were actually triggered almost exclusively by the bifidobacterium in our system. So we can inspect um, independent metabolites, and uh, this we do by, by showing these kind of plots. So these are two different flavonates, rutin and quercetrin. So they're abundant. Uh, they're more abundant in the microbiota-free bees than in the colonized bees. They're also highly depleted in the hive bees. And in the only monocolonization where this flavonate is completely depleted, it's actually in a monocolonization with the FIRM5, but not in any of the others, at least not significantly. For quercetrin, the picture looks a little bit different. Several other bacteria can also utilize this particular substrate. So there seems to be some kind of substrate specificity for flavonates in this uh, gut microbial community. Similar analysis also for the bifidobacterium, for the two host-derived metabolites, prostaglandin F2-alpha and one of the juvenile hormone derivatives, um, highly abundant in colonized bees relative to microbiota-free bees, and the only mono-association treatment group where it's induced is the bifidobacterium, as well as in hive bees, which again shows that actually what we study here in, on the laboratory setting is relevant um, in the colony out there in the environment. So finally, uh, what we try to do is we ask the question whether we can recapitulate some of these findings using in vitro experiments. 
because most of the substrate which we actually had identified came from the pollen diet of bees. So we um, designed uh, minimal media for all our seven different bacterial species. Uh, we extracted, uh, we did water extractions of, of pollen grains, of sterilized pollen grains, and then used this as a growth substrate for these bacteria. <clears throat> and what you can see here, for example, for the firm five is that even though it grows a little bit in that it's not a completely re minimal medium, it's a, it's a carbohydrate reduced medium, it grows much, much better when you add actually that pollen extract, 10% uh, pollen extract uh, was added. And then again, we did metabolomics at time point zero and 16 hours to identify which metabolites are accumulating when the bacteria grow and which metabolites are disappearing when the bacteria grow. And in black, you see here, this is a volcano plot. So you have the fold changes here, negative, positive, and the p-value. And in black, you see the pollen metabolites, uh, which are, seem to be disappearing. And we highlighted here uh, flavonoids, glycosylated flavonoids, which seem to be all disappearing when the bacterium grows, and breakdown products as well as flavonoid aglycones, which seem to accumulate. So we can really nicely recapitulate some of these findings, which we can, which we, the findings which we have from our in vivo system using these in vitro culture experiments. So this is great because this means we are also a little bit independent. From, from the in vivo system from the bees because we can only work with bees uh, during the summer months. So uh, very uh, short conclusions. So we identified many uh, metabolic changes in the gut between colonized and microbiota free bees, which really suggests that this microbiota has a, has a, has a huge impact on the, on the metabolic profile in the gut. 80% of these changes could be explained by the monoconizations, which tells me that uh, these bacteria seem not to be completely dependent on each other. Um, you need to keep in mind that this microbiota has probably evolved 80 to 100 million years uh, together with its host. So this is quite uh, remarkable, I find. And we could at least some of our findings from the in vivo experiments recapitulate in vitro. So very uh, small uh, model. So we think that um, the host as in mammalian gut, uh, takes up all the simple components, all the simple sugars and amino acids from the pollen. How pollen grains are actually broken open in the bee gut, we still don't know yet. Maybe the microbiota plays a role there, um, but this is just speculating. But then these um, indigestible compounds of pollen enter the hindgut, like in the mammalian system, and there is where the bacteria um, come into play, where they utilize secondary plant metabolites, flavonoids, um, uh, omega hydroxy acids, phenolamides, which are present mainly in, at the outer pollen wall, but they also seem to utilize carboxylic acids, nucleosides, as well as sugars, which apparently the host can't take up from the, the cytoplasm of, of uh, pollen. Leading to fermentation products, breakdown products, um, how this then actually impacts the host and which of these metabolites um, are responsible for these effects Nancy Moran has seen on, on, on the host metabolism. This is something we need to, to study in the future. So with this, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, mainly two people who were, who were really taking the lead on that project. This is uh, Lucy Kessnerover, a PhD student in my laboratory, uh, together with a postdoc in, in Uwe Sauer's lab. So this was a collaborative uh, project um, with, a, with a lab at the ETH, which are specialized on this mass spec method. So he analyzed most of our samples and also carried out a large part of the analysis. Um, today, I couldn't speak about other projects we are running in the lab um, from other group members. Um, collaborators, Uwe Sauer, and particularly for this project, uh, Laurent Keller, Christophe De Hio. I also would like to really point out Nancy Moran, um, since she had, has started to work on that gut microbiota of honeybees, I mean, we have made so much progress. Before, there was really nothing known about it. And uh, it's really amazing the type of work she, she's, uh, she has published in the last few years. So thank you a lot uh, for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, Antoine Damoschon first. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I think that for study of metabolism in general, it's very useful to have a baseline. So the baseline would be to find a metabolite that is absolutely essential, and that can only be provided by the microbiota, okay? In fact, there is one, 
which is not produced by plants. So this one, at least, would be very interesting uh, for bees. Mm -hmm. And this one is the derivatives of cobalamines. Yes. Did you find anything linked to that, showing that the community of microbes was producing it and that you found it in the bees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, vitamin B12. So, um, yes, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I would need to go back to one of my slides, but one of the Firmicutes, the Firm 5, I think has a vitamin B12 pathway. I'm absolutely sure that um, the Bartonella apis um, has also a vitamin B12 pathway. However, that one <clears throat> is not always present in bees, so we don't know exactly what its contribution to to bee well-being or bee health, bee disease actually is, whether it's pathogenic or beneficial. But I need to point out that, you know, we can keep these bees um, without the microbiota and they're fine. Huh? It's, it's actually very hard to find um, a phenotype um, in the laboratory. I mean, this, this body weight gain, we need to, we haven't uh, seen this in our own laboratory. So how mm -hmm. can they get cobalamines without microbiota? Because it's not in, it's just... Uh, I yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. In the food. I mean, the, the food is plants, plant. Plants do not produce it. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes. So you think this is the only vitamin which... Well, I think there are other, but this, one, but this one is very good because it is not produced. Mm. Uh, ex well, in some cases you can uh, have it in algae because algae are symbiotic with, with, with bacteria producing B12. But normally plants do not have it. So I think the, this would be very useful to have this kind of baseline. Yes, yes. We didn't, uh, I think I looked for it in our data set. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't find it. But, you know, we, I mean, it's kind of a systematic approach. We see a lot, thousands of metabolites, but if we miss one, it doesn't mean that it's absent. So, yeah. I have a question in the back. Uh, Laurence Zidjo uh, Vosier. Uh, yes, thank you for this uh, illuminating uh, talk. I was wondering whether the flavonoids that Era Melinav described in the yo-yo phenomenon of obesity, mm -hmm. yes. you know, diet, obesity, diet. Yes. So this yo-yo phenomenon of uh, putting on weight despite yeah. all Post efforts. Dieting, yeah, weight, and flavonoids yeah. are the only, well, mo one of the most prominent component that mm -hmm. prevent this yo-yo phenomenon. Yeah. How do you reconcile these results with the fact that the colonized bee or um, gaining weight yes <laughs> yes i mean i don't know whether the 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 flavonates actually um play a role in that in that uh, in that phenotype it, it could be possible um i'm not sure whether in that um study which was published in nature i think last year whether the flavonates completely um, disappear or whether they're deglycosylated. I think this could make could make a big impact. Huh? But I think this is a very interesting topic, which is now somehow also in in the mammalian gut microbiota. There's a lot of um, interest in flavonoids suddenly. So it was kind of funny that we also found them. So Philippe, at the, Pascal Cossard. at the very beginning, you said that the uh, somebody should take. Ah, okay. Okay, so at the beginning you said that the uh, microbiota from the bee was responsible maybe for the decline of the uh, bee's colony. So do you think it could be that uh, they are lacking the cobalamine and the vitamin <laughs> B12 or what? The last what? No, 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 I didn't want to say that the microbiota um, is responsible, but I think um, it's a factor which we have simply neglected in the last few years. Um, oh, so there because is... people have studied bee health for many, many years. Um, and they have, you know, pulled out pupa and raised them in the laboratory without knowing whether their bees were actually colonized or not with the microbiota. So I guess many of the results which actually have been produced, um, they haven't considered whether their bees had a microbiota or not. Mm -hmm. And what Nancy has shown, for example, in the PLOS biology paper is that there is clearly an impact. So bee colonies have been treated for 50 years with oxytetracycline in the U.S., all the gut microbiota, all the strains which you isolated from the US, they're resist, highly resistant to tetracycline, so tetracycline 40, uh, no problem, they can grow. Um, so this clearly had an impact on the gut microbiota. Okay. Hmm? So, okay. 
but it's a very complicated problem. So I don't think we can point to the microbial and say it's the microbiota. Okay. Bernard Dujon. Uh, what, <coughs> yeah, what, yeah, what you've shown, as I understand, are, are the adult bees. Yeah. Yes, sorry. What yeah. about the larvae? Are they completely uh, out of my microbiota <coughs> or they have something specific? Yeah, so larvae, they feed on royal jelly, mm, which, is, um, which has a lot of antimicrobial peptides. And uh, people think that they're uh, almost sterile, but at one point they start to feed also on pollen. So I, I don't see any reason why there should be, shouldn't be any uh, microbiota. But people haven't looked very much. If you do qPCR, if you try to quantify how much bacteria are there, you get actually very low, low counts. But th this doesn't mean that the microbiota is not important. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, right. Uh, ask the question first. Uh, 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 thanks, Elie, for this wonderful talk. My question is actually connected to the previous one. Um, uh, 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 may maybe I have missed something, but I was wondering uh, um, how, how reinfection infection is stable. Did you make any control to... Uh, to figure out whether you have the same localization and um, uh, a respective proportion, a respective uh, quantity of different uh, microbes when you infect by, by a soup of microbes, and in, in, in another way, in another uh, experiment, when you mono-infect, uh, do you ha how the, be the bacteria behave when they are mono uh, when they mono-infect the, the gut? I mean, in regard of your first question, you, you're, um, you're, ta you're talking about the immune response, right? Be you were mentioning that no, regarding I, I, the immune I, I am just wondering mm -hmm. whether you restore exactly the same scheme ah. uh, uh, when you compare with, with the wild yeah, the type insect. Do you, I mean, at, at the quanti no. quantitative <laughs> yes. and qualitative yes. levels. Yes. No, we are actually um, half a lock higher than the native bees, okay? So we do qPCRs to make sure our bees were monocolonized and that they were colonized with all seven species. And uh, if you do absolute quantification, you actually see that you tend to get uh, more bacteria in the gut under laboratory settings than in, in the hive bees of the same age. Um, bees are eusocial, they're highly social, they live in a colony of thousands of different individuals. Um, I, don't, I think they misbehave a bit uh, on the laboratory settings where we keep the bees in cages of 20 individuals and we see that they actually, they, f they, they take in massive amounts of pollen and they wouldn't take that amount of pollen in, in under hive conditions. So and they almost Bursts open um, when you look at their ab abdomen. It's uh, it's quite uh, quite extreme. So I think this is the main reason why there are actually more bacteria because there's more food, and particularly the firm five, which sits in the hindgut and seems to really feed on these pollen compounds, is the one which has uh, the most increased uh, abundance compared to hive bees. Does it impact anyhow biology, behavior, or behavior? Um, I mean. <laughs> We, we, we think about tracking bees um, with a system, um, but I'm not, um, I'm not in behavior, so I have very little experience. But we have really great um, colleagues in Lausanne who are very much interested in behavior of social insects. So we are planning to use an automated tracking system, so that would be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, one question on, on this side here. C can you identify yourself? Yes, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Bernard Henrissa from Marseille, mm -hmm. CNRS in France. You mentioned that complex carbohydrates were an important uh, part of the diet of the bee. And in particular, you said that pectin was one there. Yeah. But the degradation of pectin takes dozens of enzymes there. Did you find these enzymes in yes. the microbiota <clears throat> yes. of mm -hmm. the bee? Yes, so they have, um, so we sequence a lot of genomes. Um, of these uh, of different bacterial strains, and there's a, a huge genetic diversity and diversity in gene content between even between different strains of the same species. And and one of the the major um, enzyme classes or, or functions which differ are actually um, glycoside hydrolases, which are exactly the enzymes which cleave off uh, sugars from each other, polysaccharides. And there's a you know there's a specificity. A certain enzyme can only cleave a certain um, polysaccharide linkage and so on. 
Um, <clears throat> so we found a lot of these beta glucosidases and so on. So I'm pretty confident that they can cleave off most of these sugars sitting at the, the side branches of the diff of pectin. And the bacterium I had identified, Giliamella, has actually the pectinases. And the most closely related to the pectinases you find in plant pathogens, you know, with, which use pectinases actually to like um, the decay or. Um, but does this apply also to Frischella? Mm. Frischella? Uh, Frischella? Uh, no, no, Frischella yeah. doesn't have this. So what would Frischella feed on? Um, we have some evidence from, from the metabolomics. Um, we see clearly very specific compounds which disappear um, when this bacterium is, is there. Um, very little is known about these, these metabolites, so they're clearly coming from pollen, but uh, there's actually very little knowledge on, on, on these metabolites in, yeah. in pollen. I would, I would suggest to check sucrose. Sucrose? Yeah, because you got a sucrose gene in Frischella. Okay. <laughs> so you looked at it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean... <clears throat> you have a right. uh, yeah, that's probably one source. But one, actually, we see when, when pollen is there, that Frischella grows much better than when we just feed sucrose. So one last question from Christian Dumas on, on that side. Uh, pollen, pollen triphene contains a lot of uh, protein as well as lipids. So you... Did they play any role? Uh, we didn't find a lot of, I mean, the proteins are probably uh, taken up by the host, I imagine. Um, we found um, fatty acids. Um, these omega hydroxy acids were among them, but um, our collaborator actually told us that his method is not the best for looking at, at lipids. So he was very, uh, very subtle with, with making any conclusions from his data. So. But there wasn't any very particular thing which popped up. OK, so I think our president does not dare to ask a question. So I will ask it. OK. It has to do with the honey. Yes. So what is the influence of the microbiota on the honey? Uh, I, I think uh, very little. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, we. So when we started to work on, on these things in Nance Moran's laboratory, we actually looked into honey because the public is aware of honeybees and honey, and then you talk about these bacteria, and you say they have enzymes which are related to pathogens, and so people get worried. So we actually look, we tried to amplify these bacteria from the honey, and we couldn't detect uh, them in there. So they're not in there. I don't think that... But for the taste. For the but taste, maybe. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for this comment. We are reassured.